Welcome back to the Narrative Monopoly podcast. On today's episode, we have a very special guest, Kat Cole. Kat was the Chief Operating Officer of Focus Brands, and she is just packed with knowledge. I learned a ton. We cover brand, distribution, leadership, how travel has impacted her professional life, and it is one that you are not going to want to miss. The sound is a little bit messed up on my mic. I recorded this one from a remote new location, so uh, apologies for that. But besides that, uh, I think it is an, an excellent episode, and I sure learned a lot, and I think you will too. So without further ado, let's press play. All right, on today's podcast, we have Kat Cole. Kat has one of the most inspiring and gritty stories of anyone you will meet. Her journey began as a Hooters hostess at age 17, and within two years, she was traveling around the world, launching new locations for the company, becoming a vice president at age 26. In 2010, she became president of Cinnabon, turning the company around during the recession. And that was part of Focus Brands, the parent company of Auntie Anne's, Carvel, Cinnabon, Jamba, Moe's Southwest Grill, McAllister's Deli, Schlotzky's. Uh, so it's, it, it's a pretty big company. And then for 10 years, she was at Focus. She was a turnaround artist of the franchisee businesses, grew global multi-channel retail offerings to more than $1 billion in branded sales. And she eventually became COO and president. And we are very excited to have her on today. How are you, Kat? I'm great. How are you? I- I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Did I miss anything there? <laughs> Good highlights. Okay, great. So you've broken a lot of narratives in your career. This is the the Narrative Monopoly podcast, where we actually go outside of monopolized narratives. So we won't go too much into your story because I think that there you've already done a lot of interviews on that and there's a ton of great places for people to check that out. I think the Pomp podcast was probably the most comprehensive. Um, people should go listen to that. But I do want to start, I mean, at 17, walking into uh, you know becoming a hostess and doing every job um, and you did it with a great attitude. How did you flip the switch from going from just hostess to doing those, those, uh, I know you were head of training, I believe, and then launching, launching other businesses across the, the world. I mean, cause I think most people would say, well, you know, I was a hostess and then I went to the fryer and then I went to the cashier and we're talking like three years for that. So how did you kind of break the narratives and, and accelerate so fast? It accelerated because all of those jobs are related to your point that, you know, yes, I was a hostess, only because I wasn't old enough to serve alcohol. And the minute I turned 18, I became a waitress. And then very shortly after that, you know, some of the cooks quit and I learned how to be a cook and started working kitchen shifts. And within a matter of months, the bartender had to go home. And so I learned how to bartend. So it is exactly what you said. It just happened in a very compressed time frame. And what compressed it was one, I was willing to do those jobs. I actually wanted to do those jobs. I needed the shifts. I needed the money. You know, the more jobs you can work in a restaurant, the more shifts you have access to. Now, they don't all pay equally, but if you can fill in the gaps, it's a pretty awesome money making endeavor. And so it was both out of curiosity to see if I could do all those jobs. I was genuinely and always have been very helpful. I wanted to help people who needed help. And it was self serving. I needed to pay my bills, I needed to save for college as the first person in my family to get into college and a very poor family. And so I needed the money. And so it was pretty simple. But what working all those jobs did was give me a foundation to understand how the restaurant works. And then I became a trainer. So that is the next layer that everyone doesn't do. I took the responsibility to train new hires on a regular basis. I think at the peak, we only got paid $1 more per hour for the training shifts, but we did get to pick the best sections, which ultimately equated to uh, far more dollars throughout the shift. So there were some financial benefits, but it was a lot of work to train someone new all the time while you're trying to take care of customers. And, uh, and I enjoyed it. 
And so layer that on. I was experienced in teaching new employees uh, how to do the many jobs, not just one in the restaurant. I myself had done all the jobs in the restaurant. And so that's what I did. Then there were managers and people who thought a lot of me, gave me feedback, gave me a chance. So you can't take those, whatever you want to call them, bosses, leaders out of the equation. And the company was growing. You also cannot remove that from the equation and have the same outcome. Growing company, they need a lot of people who know how to do the jobs, who know how to train the jobs to travel to go do that in the places where the business is expanding. And there's nothing about that that is unique or uncommon. Um, what it all led to for me is a little unique and uncommon, but that alone is very typical in retail and hospitality. You, you need people who know the jobs, you need people who know how to train the jobs, and then you need a few of them who are very good to be willing and able to travel to go launch new franchises. And the Hooters growing piece of the equation, what amplified it is they were growing globally. And the first opening I ever did as a traveling opening restaurant trainer happened to be Sydney, Australia. And then the company kept growing and I kept figuring out how to launch franchises. And very quickly, I was leading the teams around the world instead of just working on the teams. So it sounds to me like it, it was a combination of you just had the right attitude, you had the drive, and it met the opportunity that you had because it was a, it was a growing company. So you were able to scale with it. Now, the, the other thing I kind of heard in there, which is something that I believe, and I, I want to ask you if, if you think it's true, which is the best way to uh, learn something is actually to teach it. W was there some of that in there? Sure. I mean... Certainly, you can't teach something unless you have some foundational knowledge. And so the best way to learn something is to actually learn it first, at least to some degree. And then, yes, whenever you have the confidence and the desire to care for others and teach them, teaching things certainly elevates and expands whatever it is that you've learned. Great. So, so I think again, if, if people want uh, your full rundown of the career, um, th there's a lot of podcasts. Pomp Podcast is, is one of them. Um, but I know that you love talking about brand. So let's let's jump into brand because you know when I was a, a lowly business student, uh, I, I was taught that there was this thing called goodwill on the balance sheet, and mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a little amorphous. You, you can't really put your your finger on it. So I want to open up. Um, to you, an open-ended question, you know, what is brand and, and why is it so important? Brand is simply a promise, a perceived promise and a relationship with the consumer. That's it. And the word perceived matters because just because a business has a proclaimed purpose, promise, mission, doesn't mean that that's what the customer perceives it is. So it is this perceived promise and relationship with the customer. And certainly there are things that feed that over time, what the brand says, what the brand and business does, the quality of the product, other interactions, then consumer perception over time. You know, there are many, many things that go into what makes up that promise, that perceived promise. But at the beginning, for anyone who's a founder of a startup, an early stage company, the brand is the product because that's the only thing customers are really interacting with or service. And then it evolves, you know, as more communication expertise evolves, more marketing gets out into the world as customers have extended and repeated experiences that either take their relationship up or down uh, as customers evaluate, is my experience congruous with the promise of the business? Is it better? Is it worse? Am I getting what I paid for? And then is that a good value for me over time? Can I trust it? So there, you know, it evolves over time, but essentially it's the, the perception and promise of the business. Now you said there's a lot of things. Let's, let's unpack that. What goes into mm -hmm. the perception, especially for a mature brand? Because, you know, when you walked in and you took over Cinnabon, that was, I believe that they weren't uh, having the best time, right? With the recession, mm -hmm. um, but you did have a brand to, to work with. So I guess maybe use that as a launch point of what goes into that and, and how do you tweak those levers? One, I would caution anyone of thinking of brand too academically. There are ways to think about it academically, but that is not typically what will serve someone running a business right now. What is most important and what is in the suite of levers, to use your word, 
are the experiences, the interactions, the moments of truth that the customer has with the business. That might be the website. It might be customer service. It could be the product. It could be the environment in which the product is sold and what that experience is like. It's the quality of the good or service, uh, the price positioning of the product. I mean, all of this is psychology and emotion. And as a business matures, there are more interactions that are real with the customer that start to define the brand and become a much heavier weight in the brand equation than what the brand message is, right? You can market all you want. And certainly if you're one of the behemoths with multi-billion dollar marketing budgets, you can say a lot that fills people's minds with thoughts about the brand. But most businesses cannot market their way out of a mature business set of experiences with customers and their product. That carries more weight. Like each customer interaction with the product has a few exponents on it. I mean, it is exponentially heavier in terms of brand perception than an ad. Of course, we trust what we experience more than what a company tells us about themselves. And that is only more true as time goes on and people lose trust and faith in institutions. And so it's about the customer and their experience. And in, in, a, in a way that is evolving, that's a mark of modern brand leadership, the employee experience with the brand and how they speak about it, what they tell their friends and family, how they, uh, how they reference, how they're treated, what the culture is like, that is a growing contributor to the consumer perception of a brand. Yeah, you know, that that's actually the last point. That that's really interesting because um, you know, I lived in San Francisco for a few years and everybody wears their uh startup swag, right? Like their t-shirt or their backpack or their, you know, their Patagonia. And and you definitely notice, you know, who's repping the hardest. Um, you know, why aren't you repping your your company if if uh you know they have the swag? Uh that that is an interesting point in terms of interactions. So I would imagine that the basically like the nth interaction that you have with someone is going to be weighted even less, right? So the first time I interact with a brand, first impressions matter. All right. The second time I interact, it, it matters just a little bit less. I already have a data point. And then, you know, the, the thousandth time I go to Starbucks, it doesn't really impact me. Is that, is that kind of, uh, you know, part of the equation there? No, no, I wouldn't think of it as sequence at all. Um, it is what happens in the interaction. It is the degree to which the expectation of whatever that interaction is, is met, missed, or exceeded. It could be the thousandth interaction, but if an employee does something to absolutely delight me and blow me away, all of a sudden my feeling, my emotion, my affinity, my connection to that brand is stronger. At the same time, on the second interaction, after I had a great first interaction, if the opposite is true, I can become quite distanced from the brand. And there are many things that go into that um, decision equation of, do I give a brand another chance? How severely does this affect my perception of the brand? You know, and it, it has to do with all the pieces, price, um, relevance in my life, which price is a part of. How special or different is this? Do I have other options that are easily accessible? I mean, this is where you could get pretty academic, but at the end of the day, people's time and money are valuable and hard earned. And if they are giving a business, if we are giving our, a business, uh, you know, our, our cash and our time, certainly it, this becomes much more heavily weighted if it is an occasion-based business, because it's not just my time but it's those that I'm bringing with me. It's the people I'm planning an event for. You know, reputationally, good goes farther in occasion-based businesses and bad goes farther in occasion-based businesses. So, so it's fickle. It, it can change at any moment and it must be guarded. Yeah, I, you know, I wouldn't use the word fickle because that suggests that it's not controllable, right? It's, it is, it varies is a better way to put it, but it varies by what you choose to do or choose not to do as a business. And the more layers you have between you as a founder or a leader and your customer, you know, the better you need to be at leadership <laughs> to make sure that whatever your intention is, is making it all the way through to the customer's experience. And truly some of the best 
brand building moments are when a company screws up. Those are the opportunities for leaders to lead. And they are the opportunities for brands to become even more loved than they were before the experience. That that's so interesting. You say that because I, I did read something about uh, you know if a brand screws up and they correct it, the basically like their MPS just goes through the roof. And that <laughs> that that happened to me recently, well a, a few years ago. Um, so so I'm a runner and and um, I I'd switched brands shoe shoe brands many times, and Brooks sent me like a just a bad pair of shoes and without question they refunded me sent me a new one and uh and i i have not changed brooks since then so it's definitely worked on me in terms of in terms of how internally companies should think about this because you know you're advising startups and companies right now um should brand be something that functions uh lead into, right? So, so each function is thinking about a brand. So whether that's product or sales, or is brand kind of more of an umbrella that uh, would, would touch down onto the product and sales. So um, more so, you know, th- there would be people in a company thinking about brand that would actually have the ability to, to put downward pressure on those teams. You know, I would, I would say, instead of using the term downward pressure, because that suggests there's a hierarchy of departments that's probably not practical. Often in a company, as it scales, as it grows, you do end up growing departments that focus on brand and brand almost exclusively. The voice of the brand, the tone, the graphics, the look, the pat, like over time, you do need some focus on brand alone. That is not the case in the early days, because it's so intertwined with the few things that you sell or do, but eventually you do have that. Um, And so on one hand, you could say that the CEO and the CMO are the ultimate arbiters of the brand. Um, But if you are talking about scaled companies, and I'll just list some of the departments you mentioned, you know, sales sometimes is its own beast. And if you think about reporting in an organization, you listed several functions that need to be compensated slightly differently in order to be effective. They need to have unifying drivers around leadership directives and compensation, and they need to have unique drivers, which would suggest that many of them do not fit cleanly together in the way that you described in a scaled company. Again, when you're small, you know, pick a seat, you can all fit in a room. But whenever you grow, certainly functions like sales tend to have their own lane. And of course, they have connectivity to brand. Everyone in the company has connectivity to brand. But the people who oversee brand, voice, emotion, psychology of the business are rarely the supervisors of people who are leading other functions. Often brand is a component of marketing in a mid-cap business. And then as it scales, you might end up with a chief brand officer and a chief marketing officer. And if it's an you know, a e-com forward, digital forward business, then maybe you have growth under that. Or if it's, you know, if it scales and you end up with a chief growth, chief growth officer and a chief revenue officer. But in mid-cap, all those things get collapsed under marketing, but they typically do not oversee sales in a traditional sense. Sales would often fall under development unless sales is so tied to revenue in a particular format of business. And then that might be, you know, re- revenue and sales might be together for a while before they get bifurcated. Gotcha. Um, all right. Last question on brand. Who are some of the brands that, that you are just blown away by? I mean, it's not, I'm sure it's not a surprising list. You know, the brands that um, consistently make it in the most trusted brands list, the most loved brands list, Apple, Nike, Patagonia, um, there are many, many others, but brands that have stood the test of time, have innovated, um, stand for something in their business, have a clear visual point of view and emotional and psychological and social point of view. And so brands, um, you know, brands that have been able to do that over the decades are some that I love the most. I mean, there are a ton of tiny brands, early stage brands that I love, 
but most of them have not been put to the test <laughs> in the way that the companies I just described have. So they're great. They have all the potential in the world, but I would encourage anyone to just Google most trusted brands in the world and take a look at who comes up and who seems to be repeatedly on that list. Sure. Sure. There's a lot to learn there. Um, now I, I'm kind of obsessed with, uh, with distribution and normally that, that is in the context of information and information technology. Um, but I know that you did a lot of, uh, really impressive things in, in terms of leveraging different points of distribution for Cinnabon and at focus brands. Um, how do you think about distribution broadly and, and maybe, um, through the lens of, of what you did do at, at Cinnabon? The way I think about that is really a lens of growth because distribution is just a piece of growth. And, and if founders or leaders forget that, they'll make some pretty expensive distribution mistakes. And so when I think about growth, I think about bumpers in the growth bowling alley. And on one side, you know, keeping you out of the gutter essentially, but allowing you to ping your way to try to hopefully get it down the middle or pretty close. And on one side is this mindset of if we don't, the competition will. So as it relates to distribution, you think about if we don't go here with these people now or soon, the competition will. How do we feel about that? Is that okay? Is it better for them to go? Should right? So that question is a bumper in the bowling alley. On the other side is the opposite mindset. So that, that first bumper in the bowling alley is about fire in the belly, being experimental, finding partners, being really scrappy and fast in deciding what you should build, rent, or buy in terms of distribution capabilities. And that usually leads you down the path of partnerships in some way. And so that's the scrappy, go fast, grow. The answer is yes, distribute. On the other side is the opposite, which is just because we can do something does not mean we should. Um, at the same time, just because we should do something does not mean we can. And as it relates to distribution, supply chain is a pretty big question mark in distribution if it's a physical goods business. If it's a tech business, that's a, a different animal. Although you do have selling cycles and expansion cycles that, uh, you know, that are still distribution challenges. If you think about supply, right, with supply and demand, you still have supply challenges if you're looking to accelerate distribution of your business. If it's a tech business, you're expanding from enterprise to SMBs. That's not easy. You don't just jump the moat, right? You've, you've got to have different sales teams, a different mindset, a different time horizon, different tools, a different set of leadership approaches. And so these two mindsets, if we don't, the competition will, and just because we can does not mean we should. And just because we should doesn't necessarily mean we can, are about the right balance or blend. It's not perfect balance. It's the right harmony for where you are as a business between fire and edge and hustle and responsibility and thoughtfulness um, and, and really being a fiduciary of your business. And, and then you find your way in between. And the way we found our way in between, not only for Cinnabon, but for the other companies that I ran when I ran the parent company, Annie Ann's and Jamba and Moe's and these others, it goes back to that rent build, you know, build rent or buy. Do we have time to grow our own distribution? Does that make sense financially? If it makes sense financially, does it make sense for the time horizon that we want? Just because we can afford it doesn't mean we can do it quickly. Businesses that require real estate are a perfect example of something that couldn't be scaled quickly. Just because you have the money and just because you can and just because you should, you might not be able to do it as quickly as you need to from a competitive standpoint. So that may push you to partner, which is what we did with our brands. It took a long time to sign up franchisees and have them get loans and build their real estate and then market their businesses and then get some local scale with a few units. But launching a store in store concept was incredibly fast. No permitting, no new franchisees, lower, uh, lower requirement of capital, lower revenue per unit, but this was about time. And so great leaders look at these things on a sliding scale and understand how to make the best decisions with all of the variables that they can at a given point in time. Money, time, brand, the competitive set, right? You're always factoring these things together to decide how to distribute. 
Um, certainly breaking out of our industry, going beyond the store and store concept, leaping to grocery was quite novel. Um, we weren't the first to do it, but we were the first to do it in that big of a way for that long, creating a multi-billion dollar grocery and alternative retail business outside of the franchise business while the franchise business was growing rapidly. People mistakenly believe one happened at the expense of the other. That's true for some companies who have tried that. That was not true for ours. Launching into one channel fed the other, then the improvement of that channel fed the other, and it was a growing accretive ecosystem of expanded distribution. We did manufacture our own product uh, at the beginning, and we decided that was not a capability that we wanted to continue to try to build. It's difficult, it's hard, and we're a brand company and an IP company and a franchising company, not a manufacturing and logistics company. So the few plants we had, we happily sold. Uh, and then licensed the business back so that we could manage uh, manage what we knew how to manage. And then the go forward distribution expansion that we had was often through licensing, co-branding, partnerships, strategic alliances, and of course, more asset life franchise. Now let's, I mean, I mean, that's, uh, th- that is a very wise answer. Um, let, let, let's break down each concept. So store and store. So you walk in, you have a, a pretty massive real estate footprint. I don't want to speculate, but I think most of the locations were in shopping malls. Nope. Uh, Cinnabon about a th- maybe just a little under a third were in malls. Okay. Um, when I, By the time I left, a third were in malls, a third were in travel plazas, a third were in store and store alternative concepts. When I took over, maybe about half were in malls. Okay. And, I, I mean, that's, that's my, uh, th- that's where I saw them. So <laughs> a little yeah. bias there. <laughs> yeah. Malls, airports, train stations. Uh, when I took over the store and store was only an experiment and we had a couple of SKUs in grocery, but as it relates to the franchise business, about half were in malls at that point when I took over and it's less than 30% today. And it's grown rapidly. It's not because it's shrunk. Gotcha. And and what exactly was the, the store and store launch? You're just launching new products out of the existing portfolio of stores. No. So you take Cinnabon and instead of requiring a quarter of a million dollar capital investment that does five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars a year, you shrink it down to this literally tiny, tiny mini business operation that is 50 square feet. It's like three SKUs instead of 30. It's one tiny micro oven instead of a huge one. It's two beverages instead of 20. And you package that as a franchise opportunity and allow people to put it inside of their existing stores, restaurants, or facilities. So they've already got kitchens, they've already got um, receiving and storage and, you know, all it's literally a store within a store. Gotcha. Okay. I mean, that's, that, that's a, that's a pretty great concept. Is that, and did, how did that work out uh, pretty well for you guys? Yeah. If we had not launched what was called Cinnabon Express, which we opened a little over a hundred of in 2011, we would have had net negative growth. Damn. And then going into the grocery business, um, obviously you, you looked at it and said, okay, we can, we can leverage the distribution of grocery stores. Could you explain the story behind that of how that line of business came to be? Sure. Uh, many years prior to me arriving, Cinnabon did a partnership with Pillsbury where they put Cinnabon, Cinnabon, Cinnabon cinnamon inside of Pillsbury cinnamon rolls. It was an ingredient play was licensing the proprietary cinnamon. It actually is proprietary. It's milled differently. It's more aromatic. It's more gooey. It's more sweet. Um, And so they licensed it because Pillsbury was looking to plus up their SKUs. So they wanted a baseline SKU and then they wanted a more premium SKU. And co-branding and partnering is a a way to do that. Uh, So when I took over Cinnabon, that business was uh, early, growing, and a clear indication that the consumer was responding to the brand in the grocery channel. There had been some other fits and starts. There was lip balm and lotion and all of these other hypey type things that were really fun, good PR, you know, kind of a flash in the pan, but not a lot of really sticky um, licensed SKUs and alternative channels. The team had also just started a fried donut with Taco Bell called Cinnabon Delights. And so there was this one large grocery partner with Pillsbury, and then there was one 
growing, it would become very large skew at Taco Bell. So one is future consumption, that's CPG and grocery. The other is immediate consumption, that's food service or wholesale. Those are the terms people use in the industry when uh, a food production business sells to another food retailer where people are going to eat it immediately. So that's Taco Bell, QSR, other restaurants. So these were two clear examples that were scaling, that the brand had permission to travel, that the customer was excited to find the brand because there was latent demand. They were mostly in malls, airports, casinos, right? All of these places where you have an infrequent visit, but the brand love and the brand memory was so strong. You had latent demand. So the number one complaint about Cinnabon is I love it, but I can't find it. The number two complaint was I love it. I sometimes can find it, but I can't eat it all the time. And so that gave us the opportunity to do smaller, less sweet beverage, coffee, creamer, baked goods, cereal, you know, all the things the brand eventually uh, spread into. It was, it was just really obvious that the seeds that were sprouting out of the ground could become, you know, entire forests of indulgent opportunity all over the channel. I mean, I think Cinnabon today, and again, we did this with the other brands. This is not just a Cinnabon story. It's Right. Annie Ann's and Moe's and Jamba. Um, but I think Cinnabon, I don't know how many technical aisles are in grocery. I can't remember. But that brand is in 80% of them. Um, I mean, it's obviously not in protein or in produce. But almost everywhere else in a food or beverage, consumable, um, that brand has just unbelievable ability to be deconstructed and reconstructed and the customer gives it permission to travel when it's done properly and marketed thoughtfully. So it's become this massive branded ecosystem. I mean, that's first of all, that, that feedback from the customers. I mean, that's exactly what you want to hear. And you guys clearly leverage that in, in an exceptional way. Let's shift gears to the future of the restaurant industry. So um, I haven't talked about it a lot on this podcast, but I was a, a fairly early employee of DoorDash and have probably spoken to probably a thousand restaurant owners in my life. And I know that these are some of the hardest working, most innovative people that you will find. Generally speaking, how do you feel about the future of the restaurant industry? And is there anything that's, that's top of mind for you? We'll, we'll start there. And I feel incredibly excited for the future of the, of the restaurant industry. People want to eat. <laughs> they want food made for them. Maybe not all the time, but often enough that it's one of the largest employers in the United States and in most developed countries. So restaurants are exciting. They're fun. They're a place for innovation. You know, it starts there before it ever gets to packaged goods or other forms of food retail. So restaurants um, are just beautiful and the bedrock of community and the cradle of innovation for food. At the same time, the definition of what a restaurant is has evolved wildly. And that's not a new thing. That's not a 2020 thing. That's been going on for a long time. I mean, we just discussed how a restaurant brand evolved. I mean, 70% of Cinnabon's global revenues come from non-restaurant product sales, non-franchise product sales. Yet people know us for the restaurant, love us for the brick and mortar restaurant. It's still the heart of the brand, but the business is so much more than that. And that has the potential to be true, maybe not to that extreme, but in concept, that is what the restaurant of today and the future is. It is a place for beloved food creation and innovation where people can get food and sit down and have it, get it packaged to go, get it delivered, have a cooking class, buy the secret hot sauce online, find that hot sauce sold at the local Whole Foods or on Amazon, um, local collaborations with a local meal delivery or meal kit business to feature the famous bowls from that restaurant, right? It is so, restaurants are so omni-channel now and they have been for so long, but anyone opening a restaurant today uh, has the potential to meet all or many of these need states and these opportunities to delight their customers wherever they are. And it also doesn't require a brick and mortar, um, or at least not one that faces the customer. And so the path to get into being a restaurateur 
um, has also opened up quite widely. Yeah. Are you, are you bullish on the trend of these ghost kitchens or or commissary kitchens where you have, uh, multi restaurants, uh, or multiple amounts of restaurants that share a kitchen and they're delivery only. Um, and in some cases there are these ghost brands on these delivery platforms where very much like the store and store concept, you have entrepreneurs, um, who will go to these restaurants and say, Hey, here is uh, the, the recipe for these items. And all of a sudden you're selling hot chicken out of a, out of a normal, uh, you know, just American restaurant or, or, you know, Chinese restaurant. And all you have to do is, is follow the recipe. And all of a sudden uh, the consumer is getting this, this fried hot chicken from a place that they, they don't even know. Um, or it's just out of this commissary restaurant. Are, are you bullish on, on that trend? I mean, that's, I would say for the consumer listening, that's not new also. It's been going on even with Uber Eats and DoorDash, virtual brands for six, seven years. Um, People are just talking about it a little more now. And certainly you have accelerated versions with celebrity brands like Mr. Beast Burger and others where it's, you know, not just one virtual concept starting out of one restaurant uh, or a dark kitchen. It's hundreds of them popping up what feels like overnight using a variety of distribution methods. What I'm bullish on is food innovation, both in terms of the product itself and the distribution method. Bikes, carts, drones, drivers, that's what I'm bullish on. Cloud Kitchens is just one tiny piece of what is the ecosystem of where food is prepared, right? Food has to get made. What's starting to happen is apps are launching to allow a chef to make it and sell it out of their home. Anyone could, as long as the math works, go into a commercial kitchen, which may be called a cloud kitchen, but it also could be just a shutdown catering business from the pandemic that a local restaurant knew and they put the address on Uber Eats and now they're able to sell their famous soup out of a place where there's no walk up. And so I really encourage people to step back from cloud kitchens and trend and dark and virtual and just really see the bigger picture, that there's more food innovation than there's ever been. There's more technology to help consumers find food creators than there's ever been. And there are more flexible ways and places to make that food than there has ever been. Cloud kitchens, meaning paying someone rent to make food out of the back of their, out of their kitchen, whether it's Kitchen United or Cloud Kitchens or Reef Kitchens, or, you know, one of the, these are big brands that take down a ton of real estate that then yes, restaurateurs can go in and operate out of, but you also have to do enough sales and delivery only business to cover those costs. And not all brands do enough sales and delivery only business to cover seven, eight, nine, $10,000 a month. You got to do six, seven, $800,000 a year in delivery only business. In big cities that are densely populated, that is no problemo. In tier two, tier three cities, more um, suburban areas or office parks as offices are still TBD and their, um, you know, how much of their worker population is back to work. Those numbers don't always work. Um, sometimes they do. And they really work in all of your tier one cities around the world where you have the density where you also have the pricing elasticity, where people are willing to pay what it takes to have product made and delivered, both the menu price and the delivery cost. And then if you get enough density, then you can get all those costs down. Obviously, the time goes down, the cost to deliver goes down, the consumer adoption goes up, and it's a virtuous cycle. Um, In other communities with less density, it can be a vicious cycle the other way. But I'm I'm such a fan of all of these ways for businesses to operate, make food, get their food to people. They just need to educate themselves on the economics in the equation because it's all a good idea until you do the math. And so uh, what works for one business might not work for the other. So you're you're a proponent of multi-channel in general? Omni-channel, everywhere, everywhere the customer (laughs) is. all right, let's. Uh, let, we, we got a few minutes left here. Let's let's talk about. You know, I know that you're a big proponent of travel, um, and also go to uh, a proponent of Burning Man as well. I've done my homework. What have those experiences, and 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 I think Africa in, in particular, how, how have those helped you in in your 
professional life and, and um, in the work that you do now? I'd say any place, the continent of Africa, which is a complex network of countries, communities, languages, cultures. Sure. Um, you know, the biggest lesson for me and for business is how important it is to understand and deeply respect each culture on the ground and that there can be microcultures within the culture. That's true of companies. It's true of cities and communities. It's definitely true of continents. And of course it's true, true of countries. And of course it's true of continents. Um, but I see a lot of people with a ton of swagger who have some success in one area and assume uh, mistakenly that most of the things that drove their success will drive similar success in very different conditions and markets. And without the humility and the curiosity to seek that out and understand it, you can waste a lot of time and money, make big mistakes, um, damage relationships. And I have countless examples from around the world, Burning Man, Africa, Atlanta, um, where getting good work done or having a great experience, whether it's personal or professional, is rooted in taking the time to build relationships and ask questions first. And there are many business cases and lessons and all the academic things that you know, provide evidence to that effect. Um, but my lived experience is the same. The biggest mistakes I've made were uh, when I failed to understand the underlying cultural components as effectively as possible. The biggest wins that I've had that blew people away where people thought, I don't even know how you did that, came as a result of deeply understanding the people and the dynamics at play and building relationships. Do you have anecdotes for, for exactly what you said, the biggest mistake and, and biggest win? Yeah, I mean, I don't know about biggest, um, given the time Bigger, that we have, yeah. but, you know, examples, do you want a business or a personal one? I would say one of each. Can we get one of each? Okay. Uh, business, we were expanding any ends into Turkey. Turkey has a product that is sold on its streets and has been for centuries called Simit. Simit looks like a little skinny bagel that is twisted with little seeds on it. Auntie Anne's is a pretzel, pretzel, which is twisted dough with little tiny salt speckles on it. The lira, or the um, simit in Turkey sells for one lira, which is far less than even $1. The Auntie Anne's pretzels, we were launching in market, this product that they've never really seen or been exposed to that looks kind of like simit, but for $3, many times more. We launched the brand. We do a ton of research. The franchisee's local, excited. He did a ton of research. We show up. The business is not performing well. And once we really asked questions and talked to customers there and paid attention to what questions we were having to answer or the team there was having to answer on a regular basis, people could not understand why this twisted simit was so expensive. And in fact, if we had understood that this product looks smells a little like, and has a lot of similarities to literally the cheapest food sold on the streets in the city. We could have been more thoughtful about our communication and our market entry, explaining that it was, yes, visually similar, but very different. And because we didn't, we had a massive price value perception problem, that it looked like we were just selling big Simit for $3 when it sold for 30, 40, 50 cents on the street. And so we retrenched, came back, redid the marketing that said like Simit, but different, not better because that product is beloved and that would have been offensive, but like Simit, but different. And then we described the flavors and we were more literal and we talked about the handcrafting and all the things that brought up the value. We also lowered the price, uh, not down to where Simit uh, is, but we did the work that honored the psychological experience of someone local on the ground with a new brand and new product because we failed to acknowledge what their point of reference was. And anytime I've expanded brands around the world, um, one of the most important questions is showing them pictures and simply asking, what does this remind you of? You ask nothing else. You don't ask intent to buy. You don't ask about what price would you pay? You don't ask any of the questions, none of them matter not at the beginning, you just show them a picture or as much detail as you can, ideally even the product itself. And you simply ask, what does this remind you of? And then you crowdsource the answers and you pay attention to the patterns. 
And then you need to be thoughtful about what you learn. Maybe you need to change the product, the pricing, the messaging, the color. Um, for all you know, it you know it looks like something really bad in the country, or again, in this case, price value. So, um, and I've got you know I've opened businesses in over seventy countries, so you can imagine there are a lot of stories like that over time. Even as we got better, even as we were very very good at what we were doing, you, there's so much you never know, and you just do your best to learn to ask the right questions. Be open enough to receive, create a culture where you get candid answers and then you act on that and you do it again. Ask, answer, act, ask, answer, act. Um, on a personal level, when I was in uh, Ethiopia on the Somali border, there's a lot of terrorism in that region. Uh, we were going to help villages support themselves so they didn't have to fall victim to a lot of the negative activity that put themselves and others in danger. And we were there to help them with projects, but also to go back and fundraise to help them. And one of my friends asked the village leaders, uh, you know, what are your priorities? We want to help you. And they said water. And then we had uh, another friend say, well, what else? Give us a list. You know, we have friends, we have resources. Uh, we want to go back and really make an impact for you. You're working so hard here. And this is a matching partnership. We would pay a piece, but then it's like 25%. And then they would go raise the funds, make money doing other things to finish and really help themselves. But we also provided education and resources. And when my friend asked to give us a list, like give us more priorities that we can go help with, they all laughed and they said, our first priority is water, our second priority is water, our third priority is water. It doesn't matter if you build us a school or teach us about hygiene or do any of these things. If we do not have access to water, if that water is not able to be cleaned, to be consumed, and if we cannot transport it, to the soil where things need to grow. And it was a deep, deep lesson around priorities and always being aware uh, of what the one thing is you should be doing right now that could be helpful to other things. But you know what? A lot of groups go in there and build schools and build wells and do really well-intended things that feel good and that even make people on the ground happy. But ultimately, it does not create sustainable change because it is not the priority that is needed by those who are living it every day. That's also very humbling to think about how uh, how water is is that big of an issue um, over there. Well, we have we have. I think we have time for one more question. I know that you don't like reducing things just to to one thing, but if you were to to point someone in the right direction, I know that you you know a lot of your work now is is on leadership. You know, you're someone a lot of people look up to for leadership. Where would you point someone if they wanted to learn more uh, on becoming a better leader? The most important thing someone can do is get really good at checking in with those that they lead, caring about them, asking about them. Um, I've got tons of resources in my newsletter on what you can ask and how you can ask and when you can ask. But the most important thing someone can do to be a better leader is to care deeply ask questions, answer them or create an environment where they can be honestly answered and act on them of your key stakeholders. I mean, that is what leadership is. I have tons of systems and books. I love reading things from Adam Grant, who's a phenomenal thought leader on organizational behavior um, and psychology and just being a better thinker and helping others be a better, a better thinker and contributor at life, uh, at home and at work. And certainly I write consistently on, on leadership and hold workshops and all of that, but really it's like the wizard of Oz, you know, the answer is within, <laughs> you have the red slippers, talk to your people, ask them what they need, try to prioritize the few things that matter most and do your best to help make them as effective as you can be. And if you do that over time, they're on your team, they want to see you succeed, you have better outcomes you have a better network, you know, all these things that people write books about and teach that are absolutely helpful don't mean a lot if you haven't put the foundation in practice. Well, you, you just heard it from the best folks. So where, where can people find you? Uh, Twitter, Cat Cole ATL, Substack. Uh, my newsletter is called Checking In. I'm at Cat on Clubhouse, LinkedIn, like all the places. I'm not super active on Snap, but I'm there. But everywhere else, <laughs> everywhere else, I'm super easy to find. And I'm holding workshops on a new platform called Bright, like these one, one day, 75 minute mini leadership workshops. I'm doing a big cohort based course on 
Maven. I'm trying to find all the ways that I can to either do one to many or one to few workshops, classes, rooms. And then of course, you know, the writing uh, on Substack is a way people can go find it archived. So, so omni-channel, they can Indeed. find you. Okay. <laughs> it's a thing. All right. Thanks, Kat. Really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. And there you have it. I hope that you enjoyed that episode. Tune in next week. We have another great one for you. And leave us a written five-star review if you enjoyed that episode. Uh, Thank you for listening. 